What's up, everybody? I'm super pumped. I know I always say that because th this is the guy that, man, if you talk about heart-centered leaders, if you talk about somebody who's connected to source, if you talk about somebody who does what he says, this is the guy right here. Um, I met Aaron back in 2019, and I really connected with him during the project because he's one of the instructors of the project. And what happened was, is that it came to a point where I realized that I hadn't done the work that I needed to do to stay with the team. And I was holding them back and the team had to make a decision to vote me off. And it could have been very easy for him to have walked off and said, Hey, you screwed up. You didn't do what you're supposed to. We're out. But he spent some time with me. And he really kind of explained to me why I needed to do a couple of things, what books I needed to read. And you could feel the soul, you could feel the heart, you could feel the, the presence of the human being there. And as I got to know him over the, over the years, um, it's been a couple of years now that we've known each other, you can really see how he's developed, not just as a person, but as a leader, as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, uh, but just as a person who really wants to make the world a better place. Um, and so he's in his beautiful kitchen. Um, he's got his savage shirt on, which is so appropriate because he's a savage servant to the world. Um, and he's got a, he's got his own podcast now. He's got a lot of stuff, which he shares on social media, but he's a guy that does what he says he's going to do. And so if he says he's going to read a book, he's going to read it and he's going to give you the feedback. And so I'm really, really, really honored and humbled to have Aaron on today. Aaron, welcome to be real brother. Thank you, Vic. I appreciate that introduction. That's, that's awesome, man. It has been uh, quite the journey, uh, how we first met, the conversation, bringing you into the project. And um, you know, I'm sure we'll get into what the project is, but you know, I, I want to acknowledge you for you know, doing what a lot of guys didn't in, in not completing the first time and then coming back, knowing what you're getting yourself into to complete. So, I mean, just acknowledging the humility that takes, the effort that takes, the efficiency that takes, uh, and the overall commitment to your personal growth and to, you know, to your community. So, um, you know, big acknowledgement to you as well. Yeah, man, I appreciate that. It, it was, you, you know, you definitely, every instructor played a role, um, but you played a large, large role in not just getting me back into the project, but you were, even though we, we spoke a few times, we actually met and got, I think we got lunch or something, um, a couple of one or two times, I was always in the back of my mind, our conversation, you know, and it was like really, really powerful. And what I, what I noticed about people, the more that I've been interviewing people, the more that I've grown as a human being, what I've noticed about people is that people who've had a tough time in their past, they, they take one of two roads. They take the road of, they really want to make the world a better place. They want to feed back into others. They want to share their experiences because they don't want other people to suffer in that particular way. We're all going to suffer in life. That's just part of living. They just don't want them to suffer down the path that you went, which was a wild path. Um, I took a wild path compared to most people. And we don't want to see people go through that. Like I would love for people to be way more successful than I am at my age because they heard my story in their 20s. And they don't have to go through that. And that's what I noticed about you is that you love pouring into people because the other way that people go is they become the victim. They become the martyr and they, they choose to use their circumstances as a child or what they'd gone through to be the story of their whole life. And so you chose to, to level up and, you know, I see what you're doing now. I see the company you're with. You're with Truly, and it's an amazing supplement company. You're basically running the show there. You guys have grown at an exponential pace, I would say. And I've been in the company. I've met some of the team players. They're not employees. They're team members. And they just have a great attitude. But that took a long time to <laughs> to develop right so why don't you walk us a little bit through kind of whatever you want to walk through um and you know you you go by the fit beard on instagram um you can share some of that too yeah man no i appreciate that so you know i just want to pick up on one little thread that you left out there you know that is the, the idea of guiding other people that have gone through suffering 
And what, what I'll say to that piece is that really, and I think you know this, Vic, is that it's it's selfishly motivated. As much as we want to lead out and serve, we get something in return by serving other people uh, through the path that we've gone through. And so um, I, I love that, but it can't be completely selfless. Because if you think about how we're motivated as human beings, we are, we're pack animals or tribe animals. And so everything inside the brotherhood that we're growing, when we help someone else, we do get something back from it because we teach what we need the most. And so, um, you know, th that, is, that is part of the reason I invested so heavily into you because as I see you grow, I, I also get to grow. And that is why we built out the project and everything else. But uh, man, there's a lot of different uh, areas we can go. We've got the project um, you know talk about, which I know we'll get into details. That 75-hour personal development program for men that uh, you know brought us together. Um, you know, truly as a whole, is a supplement company that uh, we started about two and a half years ago, and it is just like you said, growing at an exponential rate. And there's all kinds of ups and downs from um, you know just running a business, especially during COVID, which is super exciting. And then there's the uh, my, my fitness back background that you mentioned, um, the fit beard. But um, you know, if it makes sense, you know, for your listeners, I'd love to kind of start towards the beginning, and um, how martial arts was really the foundation of who I am, and fitness is the foundation of that. I believe that as men, the the key to figuring out who you need to be in life is really based in your physical practice. And so, um, whatever that is for you as a man, I know that you're into cycling, you're into running. Um, the foundation for me was martial arts and starting to understand who I was. My mom put me in um, martial arts when I was about three. I've stayed with that consistently for most of my life, been a white belt many times. And I just see the lessons in life and leadership and entrepreneurship uh, continuing to go back to the basic foundations of empty your cup, begin as a white belt, have a teacher, follow you know the masters and uh, invest the time into your physical practice. And so that is really um, the start of it all was, was getting involved in the physical practice. But um, how about you? How did you get kind of involved in the, uh, the, the, physical, the physical practice? Because I think that's really the, the piece that I'd like to start off on. Yeah, you know, well, I mean, obviously training for the project, um, that, was, that was something. I've always been somewhat into health and wellness. And so I did some CrossFit younger, but I never really stuck with anything um long term i mean i did crossfit for probably three and a half years so that was my longest thing but you know growing up i didn't play any sports i wasn't a i wasn't in karate we did taekwondo for maybe three or four years and then our parents shipped us out to india and that kind of took took that out and then when we came back i didn't really get into i decided to go the other way i decided to go down the road of drugs and alcohol for a coping mechanism instead mm -hmm. of going down the road of other stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'd say that um, going down the path of, and I just finished this really great book, Being Ram Dass, where uh, if, you know, if you know anything about him, he was uh, in the psychedelic age, um, brought a lot of awareness to LSD, psilocybin, and now like has, has left his legacy as a spiritual teacher. So, um, but his anchoring, as, as he talks about his development as a spiritual teacher, was that um, it began in the physical body. He was looking for a way to cope. And so he used drugs, alcohol, sex, the, uh, the sensory ways that just you know that we both shared on. And then it eventually led to a physical practice. And so I think that as guys, we kind of pull on that thread of we want to feel something. And it can either be through drugs, alcohol, that supplement, or it can be through an exercise routine. I think either way, it will get you to the same doorway because now that you've come through the project, I imagine your exercise process is more ingrained in your life, even though it wasn't before. Is that, is there any? Anchor? Yeah, no, no, that's a, I mean, it seems like you're interviewing me versus me interviewing you, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, totally dude. So last year, as I, as I was thinking about coming back to the project last year, so I, I for, for the timeline, I did the project November of 2019 um, rang the bell, took like two months where I really just hit a wall. I mean, it was, it was a, it was a tough pill to swallow, um, build, build, starting to build the business that I was in. And in March of last year, my dad had a bike sitting in the garage. It was a nice looking road bike. Yeah. And I was like, damn dude, that's like a, you know, I thought it was like a, you know, million dollar bike. Um, 
And so I got it, went to the, the cycling store, got it all fixed up. And that was March of last year. And I said, I want to do something outside. I want to do something more consistent. I want to do something a little bit that brought me back to my childhood, right? Like being on a bicycle is very, it's the first freedom that you have as a young human, right? Yeah. You get on your bicycle. Yeah, you can adventure out. Yes. And when we were kids, we would bike, you know, 40, 50 miles all over town, not at one time, but we would, you know, go to the movie theater, then we'd go to our buddy's house and our mom would think we're just like at the dirt field, but we were just all over town, right? Just being hoodlums, like just, you know, little kids being, being fun little boys, right? Just, and so I started cycling and then I started getting into it more. Um, and that was really the start of it. And for me, like yesterday, I did a gravel race that I had no business doing. It was a 50 mile, 5,000 foot climb. Okay. And some of the descents, dude, were, I'm telling you, I had no business on those descents. I mean, it was scary, but on I was, a road bike. No, I bought a gravel bike last year. So I, I have a road bike, but I bought the gravel bike. So yeah, road bike, I, we would have been dead. I mean, they, they, there was some treacherous, treacherous terrain. Um, and I went down once, but I kind of caught myself. But my my mental mindset after doing the first project was you are an athlete, right? It, mentally, I changed to you are an athlete. You are not old. Mm -hmm. You are strong as a horse. Mm -hmm. You can continue to grow your strength. You can continue to grow your body. And just because other people are getting weaker doesn't mean that's your story. Yes. And I think like, I, you know, we can leave like whoever your, your listeners are with something tactical. Um, you know, I believe that, that that first step is really understanding that you as a man need to develop your physical strength, develop some type of suffering inside your body, whether it be through yoga, meditation, um, even I'd say drugs, alcohol, the bad trips, you probably learn the most, most from it, like the, the, uh, the, uh, the bike ride you did yesterday, uh, martial arts practice, all of that brings the sensory load like to the, the surface level. And so inside that process, you start becoming aware of the physical sensations in your body. You start becoming aware of your physical strength. Your testosterone starts dumping into your system. Your chemistry starts changing. Your flow starts happening. Like that, I believe, is like the anchor point, the foundation, the start to discovering whatever it is you want to do. So if these guys that are listening could take anything away from this, you know, it's like build that physical foundation because that's, that's what we, that's what we do as men. So I, I love that, man, because that, that was one of the biggest things I think from our, um, when you um, didn't make it through the first project class and there, we had that epic, that, that epic part of the night, like you made it pretty far, like you're at our, our 40, I think. And so we're, you know, the, the painted picture, we're out back and it's, it's, I don't know, 12 o'clock, something like that. Is around nine o'clock? Eight, eight uh, o'clock at night. The, the eight dudes are lined up, and there's this eight o'clock at night. Yeah, and it, it, it all blurs together. Yeah. Um, and there was, you know, showdown of like, I wanted you to stay. The, some of the brothers wanted you to stay. Chris wanted you to stay. And I was like, and then it, there was like this, this torn moment. Like myself and one and one of the other instructors, Steve, had a full on yelling match with each other because I wanted you and um, and uh, Scott to stay. And they were like, no, he's not ready yet. He's not showing up. He's not putting out physically. And then the, the shift that you've made in regards to coming back to the second class and how you showed up physically compared to the first class, like there was a massive difference and you were more beat up the second time. Your knees are both fucked up, but you, you went through the work. You did the suffering and you literally tapped into that beast, which is so, so powerful. And I think as guys, we don't give ourselves enough credit for what our body can actually do. So. So I want to talk about tapping yeah. into the beast. Uh, I want to talk about tapping into the beast. Um, you know, I, I grew up and I decided like my parents sent us to boarding school to India when we were young. And our first school was we tapped into the beast because we had to survive. Like there was there were cigarette butts in our food. There was maggots in our food. There was all sorts of nasty shit in the bathrooms. I mean, we got I, I got very sick all the time and. I would do anything to get out of there. And the first project, and you know, I want to, I want to preface this for people is that we all have a beast inside of us, mm. but we've been taught, in my opinion, we've been taught by society 
And we've been taught by, by the government to not fight for the beast, but to just be passive. Mm -hmm. And the first project, I was still scared to hit another man, right? In the, in, in the, in the simulations, I didn't want to hit another man. I was scared of the beast inside of me because I didn't know that if I could control it once it came out in the second project. Mm -hmm. And everybody says, you'll know when you flip the switch, you'll know it. You'll just, you'll there, Steve, who's not the friendly guy of the project. He, he's definitely, even after the project, he still kind of scares the crap out of you. Mm -hmm. He will do anything to break you and he will break you if you're breakable or he will help you flip the switch, but he's not going to be your friend. He's not going to give you the nice words of wisdom. He's going to break you or he's going to build you. Mm -hmm. And there's a point where you guys know, because you can see it in our faces. And, and as, as I look through the pictures, I could see every one of my brothers who made it. I could see when their eyeballs shifted and they flipped the switch. But a lot of us aren't going to go through a 75 hour immersive. A lot of us aren't going to run the half marathon with a group of guys that have done something like this. And so for the person that's listening for the male or the female, because we do have a lot of female listeners too, um, which I love, how do you flip the switch in life to go from the nice person to the savage, to the nice person, to the leader, to the giver? Right. How do you do that in life without losing who you are at the core, which is a heart centered, you know, essentially you're, you're we all want to be the teddy bear that is love, a bull and giving love and leadership. How do you flip that switch? Good, good question, man. And, you know, I, I don't think it's uh, as complicated as we make it out to be. I think that humans, we. Uh, we get in our own way and overthink things too much. I think you flip the switch by flipping the switch and practicing it. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I was, um, so I did a, a, about an 11 mile run with my dog yesterday on a dog beach. So it's back and forth about a two and a half mile strip in Huntington Beach. And it's a perfect spot because I can let him off leash. It's right on the beach. He can jump and play in the ocean. Um, and what I learned early on in training large breed, especially German shepherds that are very, very alpha by nature, um, they, they want to protect their pack, their pack animals. And so when I think about flipping the switch, it's a lot like the pack mentality in training a dog. And so we do, do um, a two and a half mile strip where he's attached to my hip on a, on a running belt. And so I'm running along and he wants to sprint off and chase and he sees all these other dogs playing, they're off leash, they're going into the ocean, they're chasing the balls. Um, it's my job as a man and it's my job as the pack leader and the alpha inside our relationship as, um, I guess, student and teacher, you know, in a dog relationship to flip the switch in a way that he understands so I can communicate with him. So I, I have to physically growl or give him corrections auditorily because I'm running. We've got a good little clip going on. And so we set that pace back and forth for about two laps or about four miles. And then I let him off leash. And so that he knows that as soon as he's off leash, there's still the command that needs to be uh, um, executed. So if I raise my voice or I growl at him or I tell him to, um, to relax, if he's getting that, that prey drive, chasing another smaller dog, he knows where the pecking order is. But it has to be as simple as turning it on, turning it off so that I don't frighten the other human beings or the other dogs around. <laughs> so think good. about it. It's, um, it's the ability to practice being an alpha by practicing being an alpha. And so, um, and I use the word alpha really only from the standpoint of how animals react to the hierarchy. Right. And so flipping the switch is a mechanic and it's a mechanic that you have to practice. You have to practice using your voice. You have to practice articulating, communicating, growling and changing your inflection, your tone, your pace. The same way that you would communicate with an animal is the same way you should communicate with yourself is the same way that you should communicate with others. Sometimes there is a need to be aggressive, but to be able to turn it off right away as soon as you make your point. And so um, to flip the switch, I think you just have to become aware of who you are and practice it. Like anything else, it doesn't happen overnight. You're going to feel super awkward. Imagine the first time a lion roars, it's going to come out like, wah, you know, <laughs> right? Um, but the, but just like the animal kingdom, we practice, we practice, we practice, we get feedback. 
And then if you're in the right supportive environment, you're in a proximity of other badass motherfuckers, whether it be, you know, in a, in a mentoring group, something like the project, um, or surrounding yourself with, with the right um, podcast books, whatever it is, then you're going to get the feedback you need to hear. But I think that it begins with practicing because it, it, it's, it's a tool like anything else, right? Yeah, no, dude, that's, that's legit. Like, I love it. I, and I love that you use the analogy with your pup because I always say life is so, you can go and relate everything to dating and animals, like in life. Like if you think about how you want to relate mm -hmm. to life, it, you know, you just always look at like how you, how you treat an animal right? Like you want the animal to know where it's allowed to sit. So you give it boundaries, right? But you say within the kitchen, you can do whatever you want. You can walk everywhere, you can, but you just can't go and jump on the furniture. So after a few times he gets reprimanded, it's like, okay, I don't jump on the furniture, but I can go anywhere else in the kitchen and I have a great life. Okay, great. I'm going to sit right here. Um, and it's the same thing. It's like, as you're running your dog on the beach, you got him on the leash. He knows his limits. He knows his boundaries. And then when you let him off, he has a better time and you have a better time. So you guys have a better experience because you both know he knows what his boundaries are and you know that you can trust him not to go out and do what you don't want him to do because he is a big dog. I mean, he weighs like 90 pounds, so he's a big animal. And if he gets running, he's going to outrun you. You know, he can outpace you, I'm sure. Um, so you got to be able to say you know like when i think of creative projects when i had my uh, real estate business i would give my uh, marketing director free free like reign like hey go create this and he'd come back with something that i'm like bro this isn't anything that has to do with our brand he's like well you told me to create something so i created something that i really liked i was like okay here's the box you need to play in i gave him the sandbox that he needed to play in and i said here's some of the toys in the sandbox here's the tools. Now go make something creative for our company. He'd come back with something that everybody loved that made sense for the brand because I, yeah. so, and, so I you say boundaries and then clear communication. Yeah, exactly. Just like you gave your, your, your pup. Yes. And so the, the boundaries and clear communication and then flipping the switch, because just like humans, sometimes we don't communicate clearly enough and so when I think about flipping the switch, it's one from the standpoint of, A, you have to be able to turn it on for yourself to know what it feels like to tap into the aggression, tap into the testosterone, tap into your very biochemistry where you can get into your own fight or flight mechanism from a, uh, a chemical standpoint and not like an automatic standpoint, like being able to practice that, but also being able to not be afraid of, of, of increasing your vocal tone or your intensity so you get the outcome you're looking for. Because you th think about like a team member's um, if we're not clearly communicating with them with the right boundaries, the right communication and articulating well, they are going to be just like wild animals and do whatever they are, are hardwired, hardwired to do. And I hate comparing like team members to, um, to animals, but at the end of the day, like we're all primal beasts. And if we don't have clear boundaries, clear communication and really good rules and understanding, like we're just, we're fucking animals. We're going to shit all over the place. <laughs> we are, you know, I, I the world that we live in is such a trip to me because people want to act like we're, we're not animals at the end of the day. They want, just because we have reasoning and we have thoughts and we're not, you know, living in a forest and just laying down like our dogs are, you know, a chi uh, a cat. Um, they want to act like we're not these primal beings, but at the end of the day, we are, we are all just simple animals that just humans are a little bit more evolved, but it, our brains are not. And the more we work on it, the more we evolve them. But I, I love the fact that you, you talk about that. And to me, like I watch you on Strava and I watch you on Instagram and I see every day, right? For those of you that watch this on YouTube, you'll see that Aaron is fit. You'll see that he's well-built human being. And I remember you got, you got COVID a couple months ago, I think, correct? Correct. Yeah, right at the beginning of the year. And you still worked out. I did. Yeah. I committed at the beginning on January 1st to do uh, two things. One, uh, a 5k a day, every single day, no matter what. Um, I got into running at the, at the very beginning of 2020, I ran my first marathon and it just, it really, really connected. It helps me tap into that flow state and a 5k a day. is not a whole lot. It's a little over three miles. 
And I just wanted to do it consistently because for 2020, I'd run sporadically. I'd run maybe three days a week. And then I'd be like, I'm going to go run 15 miles and I would beat my body up. And so um, I made the commitment. If I did something consistently, probably hurt a lot less if I wanted to do something epic, like a 50 K my first ultra. Um, and so I made that commitment to be in the year and I did it all through uh, for the last hundred days. Yesterday was a hundred days in a row, uh, consistently 5k a day during that hundred day time. I did get COVID, um, which was, it was, I haven't gotten sick in five years. So it definitely caught my attention, had a slight fever, body aches, like didn't feel that great and had a plenty of excuses not to go run, but I made that commitment. And so I, I ran my 5k. I felt great. And I think that's actually what helped me get out of the funk a little bit faster, get my energy back. Um, and uh, yeah, so th that, that's been amazing commitment. And the other commitment, I'll share this with you. I've only shared this with uh, a handful of other people, um, but my, I made the second commitment. And I think this is an important thing to talk about because we've talked about our relationships and that is a hundred day sexual fast. So zero sexual gratification for 100 days. Um, been dating plenty, but just not taking to the point of um, any sexual gratification. And those two things, uh, the commitment to physicality and then the commitment to not expending my creative sexual energy have been probably the two most powerful things I've done in my entire adult life. Okay, now you got me fucked here because I, I did some, I'll share what I did at the beginning. So before the 30 days before the project, I, uh, I decided that I was going to have the same thing. I was going to I was going to store all of my sexual energy, all of that aggression, all that testosterone, um, all that creativity, all that manpower, all that earth, like giving life power. I was going to keep it for myself so that I could take it to the project and unleash it on, on the project. Um, and then when I came out of it, I went back to, you know, getting the gratification that I like from sex and all the sexual activity. So I definitely want to tap into that. Um, but first, I want to tap into the fact that you had excuses up the yin gang. You had COVID, right? You don't want to get people sick, although you're outside in the mountains, away from people, so you're not really a threat to anybody. But you had the excuses. And I know when I get sick, I'm like you. I don't get sick often, but if I get sick, I drop like a bomb, and all I want to do is be in the fetal position and have my mom bring me soup. I don't want a girlfriend there. I don't want an ex-wife there. I want my mom to take care of me. Like, that's just how I am as a, as a man. I know it. I don't care. Um, but you made the commitment. And when you made the commitment to yourself, you did it every day. And I, and I watched you. And then, you know, once you kind of kicked COVID, you got back up to your pull-up bar, you know, you're doing your pull-ups, you're doing your workout routine. How do you build that mindset? Like what, what, I, I know that you had the karate background from a very young age, and that's a very disciplined, very, very disciplined or, you know, organization uh, as far as you want to call it, um, or a practice, but how do you, how do you keep that as you get older? Cause I know a lot of people when they get into their thirties and their forties and their fifties, it's easy for us to make excuses about our diet. It's easy for people like, you know, I know people that are out on their bikes that ride with me, they can do 200 miles in a day but they got a belly that sits over, you know, the handlebars. And I'm like, how do you expend so much energy here? But then you go home and you fall back into this rhythm of eating shitty food or like, I just don't get how your body doesn't burn through the calories. And then you realize it's like, they do what you were doing last year. They do like a 15 mile sprint and then they would eat crappy. I don't think you didn't eat crappy, but they would eat crappy for five days, not work out. Then they'd go out on the weekend warrior it up and then binge again so how do you keep that commitment how do you build that level of discipline in your mind man first off you know be fully transparent man i eat like an asshole sometimes <laughs> i've got the biggest sweet tooth in the world i think it is a, a lingering um addiction that i haven't quite kicked that is like the last great land of you know, things I need to work through. Um, I do follow a pretty disciplined diet in regards to I fast until about two o'clock. My eating window is pretty small, but there are plenty of days during the week where there's this little uh, uh, market on the way into the canyon. It's the only little like shop around here and they make these homemade brownies. They're about Ooh. this big. <laughs> and, so for those of you who can't see it, he's, yeah. he's got like a five inch brownie that's like yeah. an inch and a half thick. It's, it's, it's like the size of my head. And I, 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 <laughs> I will literally 
I will literally crush, you know, no shame, about three of these in a sitting. And it's like straight, straight going, going to go into uh, a diabetic shock. Um, not, not the healthiest practice. It is like that binge and gore, but I know like my chemistry, my dopamine, serotonin, all that feel good happens. I get some satisfaction from it. And then I get this guilt and shame after I'm like, you know what, I'm going to put on a long fucking run tomorrow and burn this off. Right. And so I certainly don't have it all figured out um, at, at the end of the day. But one thing I do know is that uh, we as humans, we're, we are addictive animals. We're addicted to everything we do. It is a chemistry experiment um, when we have any type of engagement into any new stimulus. So this is relationships. This is love. This is TV, Netflix, our fucking cell phones, food, um, drugs and alcohol, of course, you know, short circuit that. But everything we do, it is because we get addicted to it on a chemical basis. And so um, rather than fight against that, I just know that I want to put my addictions towards something positive and the last, the last area that I'm still working on um, is the sugar. So um, to answer your question, it, you know, um, the mindset, you just fucking do it. You know, like there's, there's no magic sauce to it. Um, you, you begin by making a promise to yourself and keeping it. You know, it's the line in our creed. Right. Um, and the, there is no simple way. There is no like magical, you know, mantra that you can do to, to maintain those promises to yourself. Um, they start small, uh, you know, the, one of the first foundation pieces that we teach inside the project or that anyone will share with you is, you know, begin in the morning with some type of practice of discipline, like make your bed. So the first thing you do when you get out of bed in the morning, make that motherfucker it begins with discipline. That's a promise you can make to yourself or don't hit the snooze button in the morning. You know, that, that promise will stack. So now you've made two promises to yourself every single day. Those two promises lead you into the bigger promises like committing to a 5K a day or eating healthy or you know, doing your first marathon, or whatever it is. Um, but it begins with making promises to yourself and there is no magic to a, a great mindset. It's just fucking doing it. So before we get into your sexual deprivation, um, your sexual fast, I, I love, I love, I love, I love the discipline aspect of life, but I also love the fact that you brought up something about the fact that we are going to get addicted to everything. Do you think there is such a thing as work-life balance? No. So when people say they want this utopia of work-life balance, do you think that that just means they find the balance that works for them? Um, or do you think that's a, a pie in the sand kind of never going to happen? You know, you know what, man, I, I believe that if you have, um, figured out what it is you're supposed to be doing on this planet, if you have unlocked your purpose, if you are fueled by an internal fire and deeply connected to the work you do, like there is no balance. There's no balance in, in, in nature, other than from a standpoint of you, you balance in the sprint. And so it's a, a series of short sprints by lighter jogs and sometimes walking, sometimes hiking, but you're always moving in the same direction. But the balance is in just staying upright and moving forward to the destination. When I think about work-life balance, you know, there is no balance in the pursuit of something. And so if you're pursuing something you're passionate about, that you're purpose about, you're purposeful about, um, the, the balance is simply in staying upright and staying moving forward with that positive momentum. Um, but the, the, the idea of work-life balance, I typically hear from people who don't love the work they do and have right. not connected their work to their purpose, their passion, their fuel, their desire. Because a, a man driven by the, the, his purpose, a man that is truly committed to his internal gifts, that is showing up in the world as his authentic self, there is no because everything comes around that like he has he is definitive he is decisive he's penetrating he's moving towards that that god-given talent gift and ability he's driven directed he's pulled and so there is no balance and the rest of the world fits into that direction um the guy that's trying to balance you know a work that maybe he hates he's in accounting or he's not saying there's anything wrong with accounting i love fucking numbers uh, but whatever it is he's doing something because he thinks this is what he's supposed to be doing. Maybe he followed the, the path of doctor or lawyer because his family said that this is what you should be doing, get a degree, get married. So he's trying to balance this with the internal desire of his heart. And you think about this at, at the root cause, like we all have this thing that is pulling us. And if you are 
Um, you have this inside you, this, this passionate, creative, penetrating force that you know is what you are here for. And you have this work that you're doing that you're disconnected from. There's always going to feel instability. There's always going to feel like you're unbalanced. That's a word. Um, but as soon as you figure out what you're supposed to be doing, there, there, is, there is no balance. There's no need for it. There's momentum pointing in that direction. That's my belief. Uh, I, I think you nailed that answer a hundred percent. Um, yeah, I, I'm a, I'm a believer that balance comes when balance comes when you find what you're doing and you just do it because everything in life is going to push you towards that direction. And you're going to be in alignment with everything you do and the people around you, um, the customers you serve, the clients you serve, the products you create, the services you offer, it's all going to be pushing you towards what you want to do. So when people are out of alignment, that's when they want to find this balance in life, which I, I've always said it never exists, because if you really think about it, how do you have balance when you work five days a week and you have two days off? Mm -hmm. Right. So you're already out of balance. So like everybody's like, oh, I want work life balance. I'm like, so you want to work three and a half days and have three and a half days to do nothing with. I'm like, that doesn't seem very balanced. Like, I don't want to sit around like I, I was talking to a, I'm, I'm dating this girl out of LA and she and her sister are looking for an apartment and the apartment's you know a few hundred bucks out of their budget but it gives them a lot more freedom and a lot more space and a, it's just a way higher quality of life mm -hmm. and I said well why don't you guys just find a way to make that extra you know whatever amount of dollars it is a month and she's like well how do we do that we already work so much we need balance in our life and I was like I don't know that we're going to work out for one. And two, it's like, you, you got to get creative. You got to get creative. Like, why would you not want to have a little better quality of life and you just figure out what you're doing that you love? Yes. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think creative is, is a great way of looking at it, but it's also from the standpoint is you need to figure out who you are, or what you're, most, what you're meant to be doing on this planet. And that takes the, um, doing the hard work that most people avoid that takes doing um, the getting into the suffering and starting to understand who you are looking at your trauma understanding your misery um, all of those like unpack your superpowers you know that your, your purpose um, but it, it doesn't just show up and so you think so many people they want balance because they hate the work they're doing because they're just drudging through their 40-hour work week you know just to collect the paycheck to numb themselves sitting on the couch you know through a, a Netflix binge and so um, those people are disconnected from their purpose. And so they want the reason to, uh, they, they believe that what, that they're going to have, find more happiness inside of um, relaxing, inside of a vacation. But when you're on the path to your purpose, it, it you're fired up and you're fueled. Like you don't, you're energized by the work you do. You're living in authenticity. You're living in alignment. And so there's not a need to take a vacation. If you're living a life that is like a dream, you know, there, there is no reason that you need to take time away from it. You know, I think about the work that I do with Truling, the work that I do with the project, the work that I do with FitBody, the work that I do, you know, from a, a personal training coaching capacity, all of those bleed together in an authentic version of who I am. So I get to show up as myself and I'm just, I'm energized. And whenever I find myself, I'm doing something that is misaligned, that I'm uh, not being authentic, that I don't get to be fully transparent, that I can't give my gifts it's draining. It's so fucking draining. And then that is a good signal. That is a good trigger. That is a good opportunity to either pull the plug on that, to create some distance, or to recognize that that is not what I should be doing. But it, it takes self-awareness and it takes the understanding that um, it should be easy. You know, when you're, when you're on the path for what you're supposed to be doing, like things, the universe, like it just, it rewards you. The, it rewards you from the standpoint of uh, the universe wants you to show up as your God-given fucking badass. And when you're out, out of alignment, it should be hard because that's the resistance telling you that either um, you're on the wrong path or you just need to push through and get to the other side. So, uh, dude, so do you think, so you, you've, uh, you, you just crossed a hundred days without having any uh, sexual expressions or whatever you want to call it. Right. So you, you, you committed the first day of the year to, to no sexual gratification and, no, and to, to do your 5k. Was that the thing? Yeah. 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 So you and, crossed. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, it wasn't just, it was, wasn't just a whim, you know, it was from the standpoint of, I just ended a, um, 
a pretty long on again, off again, long distance, best friend, dating, relationship, previous business partners. And so I had this, this messy love, uh, um, love situation. And I'd say that men are motivated really by two things in the world. One is the green and one is the pink. And I'm just going to let the you know listeners uh, <laughs> for that. And um, you know, not to sound crude, but I mean, to get inside the brain of a man, like those are our motivations. Absolutely. So I, I ended the you know, long-term relationship with a beautiful girl that we had a, a very long history together. And I know my, my practice, knowing that I am hardwired as a primal fucking animal that easily gets addicted to things, the way that I deal with pain, suffering, discomfort, loneliness is to try and replace it and numb it. And so there's, there's a frat boy saying, you know, the best way to get over someone is to get under someone new. And <laughs> that is what I wanted to go back to. And so um, previous versions of Aaron, this is like Aaron, like 1.0. Uh, I was a bartender, Harley riding um, expert in Tinder and all the dating apps. I figured out the perfect algorithm uh, on Tinder to be able to get more DMs. And it was a picture of me holding a puppy then it was me on my motorcycle with an arrow to the back seat saying you <laughs> shirt, shirtless photo with me and the guys at the CrossFit gym, then a group of girls. Like it was the perfect algorithm because I come from a marketing background. And so I knew just the right things to say in the copy to create some interest, create some curiosity, and then get them into the DMs and look to close a deal. So this, this again was Aaron 1.0 several, several years ago. And so coming out of a, um, an ending a relationship, knowing that that is how I'm hardwired. I noticed the triggers. I noticed that I was downloading the apps. I was doing the swiping and it was right towards the end of the year. Um, and I was like, this is just going to waste time. It's going to take me away from my purpose. It's a distraction. I'm looking to just fill a hole because I'm trying to fill a hole inside my soul. Cause I feel the loneliness, the frustration, everything that happens when you come out of a relationship. And so I was like, fuck, I can either go down the path that I've already been. I know where this is going to take me. I know where this is going to take me. I'm going to be distracted. I'm going to chase some tail. Yes, I'm going to get the conquest. I'm going to feel good about myself, but I'm also going to feel pretty, pretty shitty at the end of the day because right. I haven't allowed myself to heal or be vulnerable in the payment. So I said, you know what? I'm going to do two things. I'm going to commit to the physicality of a 5K a day because I know that discipline will serve me in my long-term goals. And I'm also going to do something that I haven't probably done since I was like 10 years old. And that's going to be <laughs> great distance, great distance in my <laughs> sexual energy. Because there's, as I've been studying more spiritual practices, what I understand is that that energy that exists in a guy, in a man, that is our penetrating force to create anything we want in the world. Right. Um, I heard this great quote re recently, and it was, um, back up a, da a dam and power will build. And so you think about all the force oh, wow. that, that, that comes from when you are, are choosing to not release and recalibrate or recharge or transform that energy into something else. And so I'd say the last 100 days have been my most effective days in copywriting, leading the business. The business as a whole, and we are growing at exponential rate, the project is growing, uh, my overall physical vitality, my energy, my yoga practice, all of it has um, amplified and grown because I'm, I'm not just expending the energy just trying to get a, a, a chemical feeling. I already know what I'm going to feel like at the end of uh, you know, jerking off, and, and I'm going to be crude here for a second. Sure. Every guy knows like there's never a time when you, when you go and spend you know, five minutes with yourself and jerk off that you're like, oh my God, I feel so blissful and happy. You're just like, I'm just trying to get the goo out so I can think clearly. Right. What would happen was my thought. What would happen if you take that time, recalibrate, recharge, and transform the energy into something positive so you can penetrate and create in a different capacity than trying to think just with your dick? And so um, it's, been, it's been amazing. And I'd say that most guys should probably take some distance from the dopamine distraction of just getting off. Well, in Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich, he talks about the transmutation of sexual energy. And this is back in the early 1900s, right? So it, this isn't a new concept. Yeah. It's just a concept that we are not taught, right? And if you think about how kids are raised nowadays, it was Playboy and then it was Pornhub, uh -huh. right? Like, so you, you go on Facebook, you go on Instagram and you see the thousands and millions of models that are half naked and 
you get, you know, you get excited and you, then you look at Pornhub and, you know, parents don't talk about proper sexual um, courting and energy. And we don't, parents don't know about, I mean, how many of your friends know about the transmutation of sexual energy, which is essentially what you're talking about. It's taking that life force energy and it's putting it back. Like you, I mean, you know, back up a dam and power will flow. Dude, that's a, like, that's an amazing quote right there because we're looking for something, but we don't know because we're not taught as young adults about these things, right? You have to go in. I mean, for those of you who can't see, he's in his kitchen, but on his kitchen wall, he's probably got a good 40 to 50 books, if not more, on his couple shelves. And I know you've read every single one of them, maybe some of them twice. Um, and then, I'm, you know, there's just, you don't get that knowledge because schools don't teach it. And so when you think about it, like Napoleon Hill talked about the transmutation of sexual energy back in the 1900s. And he talks about that if you can take that energy, which is what you're talking about, and you can create the flow inside of you, you will produce so much more. There's also other spiritual teachers that talk about learning how to create an internal orgasm. Tony Robbins actually says that men can have multiple orgasms. But we're not taught because we're taught how to ejaculate. We're not taught about an actual true orgasm. And an orgasm is the internal feeling. It's the dopamine. It's the chemistry. It's not the shooting of as, you know, as since, since we're going to be real here, shooting your load out on, you know, your partner's belly or whatever you're doing. Like that's not that's not an orgasm. That's just life force coming out because that's the process. But the internal like if you look at your dog. If you look at your cat, they're not out there like trying to figure out how to ejaculate. Like when a dog mounts another dog, it's not because they're horny. It's to say, hey, I'm alpha, you're not. It's a control mechanism. And so as humans, we do it for the exact opposite. We do it for, for pleasure, whereas animals do it for reproduction. And that's why, you know, a lion doesn't go out and have sex with every other fucking lioness out there it does it when it's time to reproduce right the bees don't pollinate until it's time to reproduce and then they go back and they make honey so we're the only creature that doesn't realize that sex is meant for a purpose we use sex as a way to connect we use sex as a way to get away from our life we use sex as a way to feel important and special it's to boost our egos right as a man i used to use sex as a way to feel like I was somebody more important than what I want. You know, I was already important, but I wanted to feel like because of my past relationships, I wanted to feel like I conquered the female. Mm -hmm. And I realized, you know, and, and I, and I did the 30 days right before the project and dude, my God, your, your brain functions so differently. Mm -hmm. Like your brain. And, and for those that have, you know, watch porn, right. That's just another level of, mind fucked up manipulation i mean that's I, devil work yeah i feel so you know this is a conversation that i think that so many uh you know men in their 30s should be talking about because there's a lot of men in their you know late teens and 20s going into adulthood where their brains are still forming in a completely different landscape now i remember pornography growing up was like one one of the neighborhood kids had an old Playboy. And maybe someone you know, had a, a VHS um, with like some 60s like giant bush or something like that. Like that, those are maybe two things that you saw growing up. And it's like that, that there's something archaic that's like, oh my God, you got an old Playboy. Like that, that was like that was pornography back then. Now we're in a time where like, like just like you said, you pop up Instagram, you pop up Facebook, you get on uh, TikTok, whatever it is. Half the women are naked to increase their views, increase their uh, their interaction. And then that just leads down the rabbit hole of A, objectifying women, but right. also setting improper expectations inside a developing brain as to what beauty looks like. Right. Uh, it creates so much more distance between self-love and authenticity because we are externalizing our expectations with everything around sex. And so, um, and then I've, it's... Uh, it's, it's terrifying. I mean, just from the standpoint of like, what is available on Pornhub? I mean, you can very, very quickly go down some dark turns before you know it. And you're like, oh my God, I don't even know what I'm watching, but somehow this is turning me on. I didn't even think this is a, a, like a capacity to put in my brain and you just see some weird shit. And so um, 
part of the reason I, I did this, this practice is because yes, I'm starting to understand that this creative life force can be recycled, uh, but also from a, a, just a chemical standpoint, like we are just inundated with so much sensory image, imagery that is unnatural. You know, you, you did a great comparison and it got me thinking, um, you know, the, the lion on the savanna, the beast, the king of the jungle is not out there just blowing his load, ejaculating everywhere. <laughs> And I apologize for, um, you know, the vulgarity. Nope, you're good. But the, um, the reason he's not doing that is because he needs to be a king. He needs to take his energy and protect, to preside, to look over, look after, and to not be a limp, flaccid dick. And so you think about this after you ejaculate as a guy. I mean, we're just taking this, this conversation to some fun places. Yeah, I love you it. Your, 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 your vital energy is gone. Like you're pretty listless. You're in just a state of total bliss, but it is a chemical state where you don't have that same aggression. You don't have that same testosterone. You don't have that same drive. You don't have that same creative penetrating force. Like at all your, everything you're, you're going after life is just completely gone, which I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but if you're using that as an escape from your reality of your life, like that should be a good indicator. And yes, you can have dry orgasms. You can have orgasms where you feel it in a very energetic way um, without actually ejaculating, which means you don't have to actually give out your life force. This has happened to me on a few occasions, a few times with a, uh, with a, a wonderful young woman where we practice the, the act of tantric recycling, where you take the orgasm and you breathe it up into the body, up your spinal cord, and it you feel like you just have a brain gasm. It's amazing. And then one time for me on ayahuasca, where it was a full body, full body orgasm that um, I had to, literally had to check myself because I was like, did, did that just happen right now? But it, it was a completely dry experience, which was amazing. And so, um, you know, you think about it, like it is a, a chemical state that you can induce in your body through body control, through understanding, through self-awareness. And you can keep your, you can keep and maintain your energy because just like you said, it should be used for reproduction and we're not taught how to experience deep levels of bliss and sensory joy. We're just, we're just taught to expend our energy. And I think that the, uh, the reason that we are, we are trained that way is to keep men flaccid, to keep the real drive of men sedated. Because you think about a guy that is just constantly distracted and, and chasing tail and just blowing his load everywhere. He is a, a great sheep. He's a great fucking zombie. He's someone that can be controlled. He's somebody that can be controlled by sex. And if you take all that power and you don't allow yourself to be navigated and controlled by the system, uh, I believe that you are truly unstoppable and you create whatever the fuck you want. So you've read Outwitting the Devil. Yes. Uh, one of my favorite books, I've probably read it twice and listened to it uh, three or four more times since I've been introduced to it in 2017, maybe 2016. And he talks, the, the devil talks about how he doesn't need to physically be here with horns and, you know, burn the earth because people are so easily mind controlled mm -hmm. and they're so easily manipulated. And, you know, not to get into politics, but I think it leads to where we're at with the media and how everything is such a big deal right now that people are so, and I, I dude, I was guilty of it last year. I mean, um, if you saw some of my posts, I was, you know, and, and what, what I, what I want people to realize is that the people that run these media companies, even the people that are making hundreds and thousands and millions of dollars working for those media companies, there's an agenda and the agenda is the stock price. And there's a reason why all these companies are doing what they're doing, but it's not for the benefit of humankind. And if you think about the out, if you guys go read Outwitting the Devil, he'll talk about how alcohol and drugs and sex and, um, you know, fear are what are the biggest control mechanisms and then doubt, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can control the mind with you know, if you if you can get people to watch a bunch of TV, if you can get people to eat a bunch of Twinkies, if you can get people to, you know, not exercise, you, you, you've you already controlled the majority of the population. But then there's going to be some of the tough guys like you that are going to need a little bit more. So then we we build a little bit more fear. Right. Then that doesn't work. OK, so now now we got a little bit of doubt in there. Right. So now you got 
all the crap. Plus you got fear and doubt and doubt kills more dreams as we know than any disease of the world that we can man create. And then you throw in like sex and now you got the 21st century where you have all these different stimuli coming at you nonstop. It's just a fucking crazy world where we live in, where the devil has owns 99% of the population, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and you know, it's uh, to bring that because the devil can make um, some people's butthole pucker from the standpoint of, you know, oh, oh my God, are these dudes talking about religion or, or no, um, anything like that. And I, and I think the important metaphor when you think about any type of religious practice is the message behind the words. And so when I think about the devil, you know, another word for this is, you know, in the outwitting the devil does it perfectly to describe this. He, it, there is some spiritual context to it, but really when you think about what the devil is describing, it is the distraction of man. It is the sure. distraction of man. It keeps him away from purpose. Yes. And the entire, entire book, if you get it, like I highly recommend you get it on audio because they, they do a great job narrating the voice of the devil. The devil is on, um, is being interviewed by Napoleon Hill um, inside a court of law. And so for whatever reason of the book, the devil has to answer every single question truthfully. And they do, do such a great job between, but, um, comparing the two. But the, the devil, the word that is more grounded is distraction. What distractions are keeping you from your purpose, your passion, your drive, your gifts? And it is food, it is cigarettes, it is alcohol, as described in, 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 the, uh, in the book, it's sex, it's uh, any type of distraction that numbs you, sedates you, and puts you in the track of manipulation. And so it, you're right, man, you, the, you know, the devil doesn't have to exist inside this world. The distractions don't have to exist inside this world in regards to a horned beast that is, uh, you know, got a pitchfork and going to fuck you up and going to send you into, you know, purgatory. Because at the end of the day, like if you are sitting on the couch, you're 50 pounds overweight, you're making excuses, you're in a victim mindset, you are a person that peaked in high school and you keep sharing the stories of glory from back then. And you're just sucked into this, this loop, like you're in purgatory, you're in that hell, you're in living hell, because you're thinking and dreaming that there's going to be something better in another point in life, in the afterlife, when it exists right now. But it means you have to do the work, face the distractions, remove the distractions, and take control of your life. Yeah, and I, and I, yeah, thank you for, you know, the devil is just the distraction, right? Whatever your religious or non-religious beliefs are, the devil is the distraction. And that's, and that's why we get to a point in life, you know, where people say they have a midlife crisis, or you get to your deathbed, and you look back at your life and you say, I should have, could have, would have. I wish, I wish when I was younger, I would have done stuff. You know, I wish when I was younger, I used to own a wellness business and our population was 50 to 65 on average. That was our, our bread and butter. And the women would come in and majority of them were overweight. Majority of them had a tremendous amount of pain, not because they did stuff, because they didn't do anything. And when they would come in, it was like, you know, I, I was like a little motivational seminar for him because I would see these people suffering and I was like why what are your distractions in life what controls you and it's like oh I have this and I have that I have this. I said look whatever is the most important thing is what you're going to do so if you want to make your health better you got to make that a priority and as you focus on your health like for me I'll tell you last year I was dating this awesome chick um you know and I wish I didn't yeah, yeah well can't wish for anything that didn't happen right but it was a, a learning lesson but before I would go do my Saturday bike rides, because Saturdays are the days that me and my friends all get together for four or five hours, we'd go do, you know, 50, 100, whatever the mileage was as we got stronger on the bike, I wouldn't have sex with her on Friday. She could come over, she could be wearing the most sexy lingerie, she could do whatever she wants. And I'm like, I am not, like, we. Get, I will take care of business for you, but I am not going to give you that, you know, external kind of thing because I was like I need my energy for myself and she's like you're a weird human being and I was like no it's just that's you know if you look at athletes they don't you know the coaches don't go out and and okay. have an ejaculation yeah yeah so I mean it's it's there's an amazing part portion of it but everything you're talking about is just distractions right our phones are distractions like those are amazing devices but they control us Right. And there's even apps that show you how much they control you. And I ignore the app. I'm like, I don't care about my screen time. I'm still going to be on my phone all day long. Computers, 
the internet, right? All these distractions, email, you know, you know, Sharon, uh, Sharon's one of, uh, one of, um, all of our mutual buddies, coach of mine. And he says, when you check the mail from the mailman, you're not typically waiting there every day for the mailman to come. Now, if you have like a special package coming or you have a gift or you're headed out of town and you need to wait for the mailman, you'll be checking your window, but otherwise the mail comes and sometimes you don't get it for two or three or four days, but we get an email notification. We're like, Oh my God. Oh, it's just, uh, it's just truly, Oh my God. Oh, it's just from Vikram. Oh my God. It's just another email from Sharon. And we check it immediately Mm -hmm. and it distracts us from our main purpose in life. And that's why, you know, as we go back to your, your purpose in life, that's why people want work-life balance because they're so distracted from a purpose because of all the stimuli that we have coming to us. You know, I think COVID was great for a lot of people, but I think for a lot of people, it's just another distraction. Totally. Yeah. Politics, a distraction. A global distraction. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've never had a distraction like this ever. And then, you know, the American political joke, um, another big distraction, right? And then you get into like a lot. I mean, we could go down a lot of different rabbit holes, but it's all distraction. Everything is a distraction to take you away from your purpose. Right. Right. Dude. And, and uh, I, think, I think, you know, I, I, I like to bring th- things down to the ground and from the standpoint of, um, you know, we have an opportunity, Vic, you know, from the standpoint of um, growing in personal development and be part of a really cool organization that is focused on helping people grow through their discomforts so that you can recognize and realize why you're here, what your purpose is. And when I think about um, where I was a decade ago, I mean, my personal development journey started about 10 years ago. I spent the majority of my twenties distracted and I still fall victim to a lot of those distractions. I'm just becoming more aware. Um, But the, you know, the pivot about 10 years ago was when uh, I could start connecting the dots to my suffering in my life was self-created because I was choosing distraction over discipline. Um, and so maybe for, you know, I'd love to hear from you and, and I'll share a little bit too. It's like, what was, what was the pivotal point in your life where you started changing old behaviors or becoming aware of old behaviors and replacing them with new behaviors? I always think that's a fascinating point to have a conversation on. Oh man, I've, 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 I I don't want, I don't like to use the word battle because I hate the word battle, but I've been challenging myself since my early twenties on alcohol and drugs. I just always fell prey to it. But finally at around 35, um, you know, when I, when I went in and just trashed my ex-girlfriend's house one night, because I was shit face drunk and I heard she had hooked up with another guy. Um, and I, and I was a horrible human being to her as well. So, you know, I'm surprised she stuck around for as long as she did, but I went in and I I trashed her house. And for those of you who don't know, if you get into a domestic dispute, you don't have to physically assault your, your significant other to go to jail. And so, um, I went to jail, I spent the weekend there. And then a year later, the judge said, um, You know, and it was it was like the moment where you and Steve were screaming at each other that night of, you know, November something at 830 or whatever at night. It was it was a moment like that where you'll never forget it. She looks me in the eyes and she says, you look the part of somebody who's uh, who says all the right things. But I don't think you've actually learned the true lessons. And she sentenced me to 30 days in jail. And that was, you know, those, those were defining moments. And, I, and I've fallen off the, you know, the proverbial wagon. So I quit drinking for that year. I thought I had my life in control, went back to drinking, you know, kept it pretty cool, pre- kept it pretty, pretty calm. But there was things that would kind of rear its ugly head up. And, um, you know, so that's why about seven months, six and a half months ago, I was like, you know, last year I probably drank less than five times, but they were all big drinking days. Um, and I smoked a lot of pot after my surgery and there was COVID and, you know, I didn't really know kind of what was going on in the world. And so I used that as my excuse. Um, you know, then obviously going back through the project this year, that was a big thing, but you know, 35 is when I was like, God saved me by sending me to jail. 
or whatever you want to call God, but you know, my, my God saved me by sending me to jail, but I've, I've been on and off of alcohol and drugs, um, not like hard drugs, but you know, pot and stuff like that since I was 13, 14 years old. So my big, my big shift was 35 after I went to jail. Oh, man, that's, that's powerful, dude. And, and you know, a lot of times it takes something exterior from the exterior environment, environment you know, whether it be you know, going to jail, a car accident, um, a divorce, like your business failing, where you like wake up and you see the results of the work that you've been doing and how you've been showing up in the world. Because as you get distracted, as you numb, you fall into a pattern, you build that rut. And you just create this, this, uh, you create the life ambush for yourself by not even noticing or paying attention to the signs before they start showing up. Um, yeah, yeah it's just, funny you say that because I've actually had the car accident at 17, six, 16. I had the major car accident. I had the divorce. I had the business that I sabotaged, you know, and those are all things that like you just, it's just the world saying, Vikram, you're not in alignment. You know, your, your finances and your alignment are out of whack. Where, where was yours at? I mean, when, when did you, when did you decide to have that wake up call? Oh man, it, it, I had a, a whole lot of them and I think it was, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, and I shared a little bit about this during the, during the project, but man, I, uh, I was brought up by three abusive father figures. You know, my, um, my, my real dad, biological dad, amazing human being in regards to an artist, um, very passionate. He's got a lot of natural talents and abilities, but just a deadbeat, you know, just chose to really not uh, grow as a human being. Um, didn't pay child support, physically abusive to my mom. Then my mom's, uh, you know, second interaction with someone who she was trying to bring in as a father figure was a drug addict, ended up dying with a needle in his arm. And then my third father figure, uh, sociopath. I mean, he had a family on the other side of the country. He was uh, cheating for 11 of the 14 years they were married oh, and wow. li living a dual life. And so uh, and physically abusive and just, um, lots of toxicity around masculinity. And um, that was my foundation for what it meant to be a man. And so I really, I really say that I was raised by my mom. And so I learned the ideals of how men operated by way of how they treated my mom. And so I saw that as a young man growing up through my twenties though, because that's what I was brought up in. That's what I modeled. That's what I knew. Um, I, I did a lot of the same behaviors, the lying, cheating, stealing, manipulating, um, never physically abusive, uh, you know, to anybody that just was, that's not part of my hardwiring. Um, but I, I, I would catch myself in these moments where I'm like, oh my God, I'm showing up like one of three assholes in my life. Like, what the fuck am I doing? Right. And as I faced my own trauma, I got in a pretty tragic car accident when I was 19. Um, I went through the fraternity days where I was drinking, partying and using uh, my charm to charm the pants off women. And then in my <laughs> later 20s, like I got into exploring with all kinds of drugs and and just really disconnecting. I, I kept having these moments, these glimpses of um, my real self and then this this other path that I was on. Um, and it, I would say it all started to really accumulate into a crescendo um, right around my 28th birthday. Um, it was post breakup. I had uh, cheated on a girl that I really cared about um, because I was feeling the loneliness of, you know, distance and just making poor decisions. And there was drugs and alcohol involved. And then I just remember the feeling of loss. And, and again, this is why I say that men are motivated by two things. And so it was post breakup I, and I was facing this self and recognizing that I did this because I was choosing the model behavior that wasn't good for me. And so that was just an aha moment. I, I wouldn't say that what it, it was one in particular that was as violent as you know going to uh, going to jail or anything like that. But it was a lot of things adding up that was just giving me the indication that I was maybe moving in the wrong direction. Um, and then I it created openness when I had that vulnerability and I recognized that I didn't have things figured out and I was falling down the wrong path. It created awareness and openness that I needed to be searching for something else. And as the universe does, as God does, as whatever you want to call that higher power, that download that gives you the insight, the wisdom, um, a couple of good books came into my life, two in particular. One was Emotional Intelligence 2.0 by Travis Bradbury. And the second book was uh, No More Mr. Nice Guy. And I forget the title, uh, Glover, Dr. Robert Glover. Both of those books changed my paradigm of who I was, especially who I was showing up in relationships. 
And when I read No More Mr. Nice Guy, I just saw so much of my behavior and how I put women on a pedestal, how I would do these things called covert contracts, where I do for you, expecting you to do for me, not really vocalizing, articulating, or communicating the way that the man should. And then the, uh, the Bradbury book, Emotional Intelligence, um, there's, a, there's a quiz that com comes with it. And so you rank your EQ, which is your emotional um, ability to be able to communicate with other people and your interpersonal understanding of yourself, your self-awareness, essentially. And I, I did the quiz and I got a 48 out of 100. So I was on the scale, emotionally retarded. I, was, I, I it had no ability to communicate with myself or anyone else. And that was an aha moment where I recognized that I was probably the cause of every single bad thing in my life and every good thing. And um, if I could change and increase that score, increase my understanding and wisdom, start making conscious decisions, that I could probably get a lot more of the outcome I was looking for. So it was an accumulation of, of many, many things. It was like, you know, God knocking on the door of my life being like, listen, motherfucker, do you want to pay attention now or do you want me to keep delivering you a shit show? So. Yeah, man, that, <laughs> I, 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 I just, I, I, you have so much insight and wisdom because you've seen the world in different eyes than, than what a lot of people you've, you've had the challenging upbringing. You've had the run in with, you know, the drugs and the alcohol you've had the, you know, kind of life altering experiences that you paid attention to. Right. So a lot of people have those experiences and they say, why does it happen to me? Why does this keep happening to me? Why does this keep happening to me? instead of them saying, why does this happen for me? You know, what, what are the lessons that the universe is trying to teach me? What are the lessons that I need to stop? That I need to start listening to because we put ourselves into the situations repeatedly if we don't change ourselves, And so our whole life, things will happen to you or for you based on which way you look at the, the situation. And people who grow look at those situations and say, man, life is happening for me people who are victims, they look at that and they say, life is happening to me. And if we start to look at, you know, I was reading something yesterday and it said that the people who take more personal responsibility in their life tend to live longer. Well, that makes a lot of sense, right? We are responsible for our finances. We're responsible for our fitness. We're responsible for our health. We're responsible for our relationships, right? It's a line in the, in our creed that says I'm responsible for everything in my life. And that gives me the power and control to change my circumstances. I remember my uncle, who I didn't have a lot of high regards, would say things like that to me, but he was the guy that was really good at talking, not really good at looking at himself. Mm -hmm. So when you listen to that stuff from him, it was like, well, I don't really believe that this is true because you're a fraud. And so now when I hear it from people like you or Bedros or Steve or Ray or any of the brothers in the, in the brotherhood, or just so many of the thousands of, of teachers that we have access to that are actually doing the work, right? It's a different situation. Or some of the people are like, look, I'm not willing to do the work, but I know what I need to do and I know my faults. And like you, you said, I still eat my brownie. Dude, I got my pistachio ice cream in my freezer. I take a couple spoons of it every night, but 99% of my diet's really clean. You know, 99% of my day is very clean, a gallon of water, right? Really, really intense, uh, intent and focused on what you do with your day, right? How do you burn those calories? But then, uh, you know, night, like I, I think a little scoop of ice cream, one bite here and there. I don't eat processed yeah. food. You got more self-control than I do. If I have ice cream in the house, like I know I just throw the lid away because I know that I'm going to finish it. So uh, you, you <laughs> much, much more self-control than I do. I got, I, I don't, I don't know that I got much more. There's definitely other things, but you know, we, we live in a world that responsibility of self has gone by the wayside, in my opinion, you know, from my, my, my viewpoint, you know, I, God blessed me with not just two eyes, but two artificial eyes as well. And they're pretty damn thick. So I feel like, I, you know, when you're, when you lose your sight at a young age, you have to learn to look at the world differently and I see that we have lot, we lack self-responsibility. You know, we, we care for our families. We go out, we make an income, but we lack a lot of self-responsibility to actually do the deep work, you know, like reading emotional intelligence, 
reading No More Mr. Nice Guy. A lot, I've, I've recommended No More Mr. Nice Guy to a lot of men and they hate it. They say it's the worst book they've read. And I'm like, why? And like, it's just, it just doesn't make any sense. And I was, you know, as if you break it down in like a, in a book club, I think a lot of men don't like it because it calls them out on a lot of things that they don't want to admit and face. Mm. I don't know, but I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a crazy book, man. It, it really makes you, if you listen in it to an audible and you're driving down the freeway, you almost want to pull over and stop because it's like, whew, it hit, I mean, it hits me in the heart every time I hear it. I'm like, damn, dude, this is some crazy shit that I've been living my life for. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think it, uh, you know, has to speak to every man out there, but, you know, I've talked to literally thousands of men in the interview process for the project. We've had um, over a hundred brothers come through the, the project and we've had, you know, over 65 actually graduate. Um, but at the end of the day, every single one of these guys that I've talked to in some capacity has got a relationship with women that they don't fully understand or realize because over the last 50 years, you know, the foundation of this book talks about how men have been raised by women. And there's nothing wrong with that except for the, path, the fact that men are not being raised by men anymore. You look at the school systems, 85 to 90% women. You look at the more divorces happening, who ends up really taking the young boys? It's usually the moms. The moms. There, there's more people, um, there's more teaching done by women from the standpoint of it is part of their nurturing capacity to pour into to protect their young and to raise and so if guys aren't going to step up if men are not going to step up to take on the responsibility just like you said the responsibility is what really forces growth the responsibility of caring after taking for and guiding a young man to his personal development bringing him to his rites of passage there's going to be a disconnect in the generations so there's been a disconnect happening in the generations of men for over a hundred years. And it started with the foundation of, you know, getting out of the farms, getting out of um, the traditional practice where men would go to work with their, with their fathers, with their grandfathers and learn physicality, the actual practice of moving their body, working on something, using their mind. We've gone into factories, we've gone into mass production, we've gone into this industrial age and so we're separating the families, separating the biological mechanism of how men and women should be raised and we're putting these young boys with their moms. And, and so they're learning the ways of man through women and it is creating this disconnect. Masculinity is being lost. And that is the foundation of what we're teaching in the project is to bring men back to men so we can model what it means to be a man on fire driven by your purpose and to not be this little boy trapped in an adult body operating through life, just creating mass destruction. So. And, and women, you know, I, I'm, I'm on dating sites. And if you read the sites, it's, we don't want, a, we, we don't, we want, they say we want our best friend, but then they also say we want a man. Mm. And I'm like, ladies, you got to realize like what you're, what, what you want and what you go after are two different things. Like you want somebody who's sensitive, but you want a protector. You want a guy that's going to be able to take care of business. You want a guy who's in tune with his feelings and you don't necessarily need your man to be your best friend no. at all regards. Like there's a lot of things that I'm not going to share with my girlfriend or my wife that I will share with you. Right. And that I don't want to know about her hair date. I don't want to be her best friend. I want to be her her companion. I want to be her partner. I want to be her, you know, I want to be our support systems. I want to be, you know, as, as, as a mastermind, two minds coming together, create a third mind. I want to be able to think about the world differently because of you and your experiences, but I don't know that I need my wife to be my best friend. And when I tell that to people, they're like, you don't value me. I'm like, no, I value you so much, but I want you to have your, your girlfriends. I got my guy friends. Right. Like I created a brotherhood through the project of people who are like minded, who want to push themselves, that want to suffer. Right. Because the suffering is where we grow. Um, but you're 100 percent right. You know, if you look at the way that even if you go through a university, the, the men that are teaching in university typically tend to be more on the feminine side. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but it's a little bit more feminine. And so all of our education. So our first 20 to 25 years of life is theory. And it's stuff that's not even relatable anymore. It doesn't teach you how to, to actually function in society. 
and then it's done by the feminine energy and then we wonder why we don't have masculinity anymore it's and then and then we and then we shit on masculinity all over the place you're toxic masculinity is bad no it's just it's just like anything else if you don't teach people how to use money they're not going to know what to do it when they get it and if you don't teach people about masculinity they're not going to know how to use it because masculinity is what pushes the the needle forward and women get into their masculine energy and the job force but now women are masculine all day long because of the fact that they don't have the opportunity to trust their man because the man is dropped into so feminine and he's scared to get into the masculinity because and i can speak to it because i didn't know how to control it right and this goes back to the original question of how do you tap into the beast and it is through the practice of self-awareness, becoming aware of who you are as a human being and understanding the duality of masculine and feminine energy. But it is part of the, it's part of the practice. You learn from a tribe. You know, my, my dog knows how to respond in the pack that we're in because we're a part of a tribe and we, we teach and train through it. And there is that, that alpha, that beta, that dynamic, the masculine, the feminine, there's the nurturing, there's the love. But our, our, our practice as, as human beings, as tribe members has been broken. We've been putting these young boys into t- training, into teaching with primarily women. And there's some strong, powerful women out there. And I, 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 and I love what they're, what they're doing because they are hardwired to truly care and to tr- truly nurture. Absolutely, we need them. It's the men that are not stepping up. And so the call to action is really for men to recognize and realize that If you don't have a group of guys that is elevating you and your capacity and your modeling for masculinity, you're going to fall trapped. You're going to fall victim to the sins and the wrongdoings of the fathers that came before you. And so everything you can say as, as a man, my father was weak. My father was an asshole. He was ultra aggressive. He was uber masculine, whatever it is that you got to disconnect with. It is your responsibility. It is your right. It is your opportunity to fix it, repair it, and to change it, and to elevate your own tribe. Is to find like-minded men and to continue to grow. But so many guys are just scared. They're afraid of these conversations. They're afraid of the of the, the topic of uh, tapping into their masculine and feminine. Like even right there loses so many people. But at the end of the day, like that is our responsibility. It's um. Yeah, man, this is this is a, this is a topic for maybe a, a longer version of the podcast, but a loop back around, you know, full circle on it. Yeah. Um, you know, men, men need to do the work. Men need to show up and they need to show up because if they don't show up, it is the reason that, you know, the world is broken and shattered. Uh, it is our responsibility. It is our biochemical uh, hardwiring. It is how we're built. Our physiology allows us to have the strength, the capacity, the ability to hyper-focus, to penetrate, to decide, to create. It is our responsibility to build a better world. But I think so many guys are afraid of that call. They're afraid of that, that invitation. They show up just wanting distractions and to disconnect rather than um, showing up in the world. Dude, you... Uh... I, I knew that this was, I'm glad we did this on a Sunday where you had a little bit more time. Um, normally, you know, you're busy during the week. I'm busy during the week. And uh, I'm glad we had a little bit more time because I think we could talk for probably a th- two or three days straight and not even cut through the surface of all the stuff that, that you and I have, have learned together and through, um, through the, our, our short time here on this, this planet. And the crazy thing is, is like, when I think I'm smart, I just talk to people and I realize how little I actually know. And it's like, wow, it's so humbling to, to, to think that with all the books, all the knowledge, all the YouTube, the clubhouse, the Instagram, the, the different sources that we have available to us, we don't know anything really. Like we're just there's just so much knowledge out there. It's like so crazy. Um, like it's hard to think of me as a subject matter expert on anything because there's so much knowledge available. It's it's quite it's quite humbling on a daily basis. But I do think that um, I agree with you 100% that men need to step up and do the work. Um, it's one of the reasons why I love the project because it is a safe environment for you to tap into your your masculine energy. It's also a safe place for you to tap into a little bit of the feminine energy when you need to be vulnerable, when you need to ask somebody for help at some point, when you need to ask somebody to, you know, in our class, we had to carry a couple of the guys, you know, a pretty long distance until they were able to get some help. 
And so being able to ask for help and then being able to step up and lead, you know, five seconds later is such a valuable experience. Um, dude, I know that you got stuff to do on, on this day. I, I would love to talk to you again on a, on another podcast. Um, where did people find you? Yeah, man, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm all over the internet as, on the fit beard, uh, the fit beard. It's, uh, um, stuck with me for the last 10 years as I got into the physical training or uh, personal training practice, uh, but Instagram, Facebook, uh, the TikTok, clubhouse, all of it on the fit beard. And then uh, you also got a podcast. Yeah. So uh, one of our other project graduates, um, actually from your original class, Byron Ovenstone, him and I have a conversation uh, weekly called The Meathead and the Monk. It is a lot on these topics. It's uh, two guys coming together that are just trying to figure out life, leadership, everything else. And and uh, we love that the comparison of the meathead and the monk. Neither one of us are just the meathead. Neither one of us is just the monk. Um, but just it is the duality, I think, of the masculine trying to figure out, you know, when to show up with a little bit more of the uh, the monk mindset where you can be less reactive, more uh, mindful. And then also when you need to show up with the fucking hammer um, in regards to the, the meathead approach. And so I, I just I love I love that topic. And it's exactly what we got into today. But um, yeah, check that out. Um, we're, we're pretty new on the, uh, the the podcast space, but we're having fun. No, it's it's a it's a great podcast. That's why I wanted I, I want to make sure that people have access to to hear more of your content because it it's just it's profound. It's profound. And um, if you had to leave a few words of wisdom to people that you think would make the world a better place, make people more more in alignment with their their purpose, what would it be? You know, I'll bring it back to the start of the conversation. It's uh, every. Everything begins in the body. And so I think the practice of physicality is your first step to truly uncovering your purpose. And, you know, and to bring that down to the ground, it means break a sweat, get outside and exercise, move your fucking body and become aware of the sensations that are showing up. It could be the resistance, what happens in your mindset, you know, when you commit to doing something. So if you commit to a physical practice and could be whatever you want, you can, you're happy to borrow the 5k a day commitment for hundred days. I would suggest that you do it and just just be committed to that. It's 12,000 steps in a day with normal activity as you're moving around. And you can walk it, you can run it, you can crawl it. But if you spend 30, 45 minutes to an hour a day just becoming aware of your, your body, you'll build the foundations of discipline, mindfulness, um, and your purpose. And those are really what we're looking for in life. And so if I was going to leave anybody with a piece of advice, it'd be to start a physical training practice and whatever that looks like. Uh, depending on where you are um and, and then from there just build on it and continue to maintain it those promises to yourself stack the wins and fucking read books man you know, we've talked about this you know in depth there's so much opportunity to borrow the greats and the gurus information from many many years for thousands of years to where you don't have to suffer alone and so if you're if you're truly passionate about uncovering your purpose and living a life that is serving a greater good then the work and show up with physical training practice and then show up with your self-understanding and and fucking grow i love it man i love it and you know i uh i made a commitment a couple of days ago to start the 75 hard series um tomorrow so i'm going to start the 75 hard but i'm also going to put in there uh no sexual gratification for the next 75 days oh shit okay yeah you heard it here i mean by the time this comes out i'll, I'll probably be two or three weeks into this project um but you know you guys can jump on the bandwagon with me and join me for the 75 hard um I'll, you know i'll be 21 or 28 days into this when this launches uh, maybe maybe we'll have to bump this one up to the to the next weeks so that people can join in, you know, on Tuesday. So they'll be one day behind and we can hold each other accountable. But yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the 75 hard, but I'm also going to add one more layer on top of it where, you know, no sexual gratification for 75 days. It doesn't mean I'm not going to be, you know, out doing things, but it just means that, um, you know, we're going to. Yeah, we're, I'm going to take I'm going to take a page out of your book, bro. Love it. I love it. All right, Vic, man, this has been an awesome conversation. I'm really thankful that you uh, invited me on. My dog's up here drinking a bunch of water, so that's what that background noise is. <laughs> um, but, dude, I, I'm so thankful for you. I, and I want to acknowledge you again for doing the work, showing up, 
come into the project two times in a row, committing, you know, over a hundred hours to that personal development program. And then also continuing to grow as a, a human being and a man. And, and, um, dude, I'm just, I'm stoked, stoked for your next 75 days. Yeah, man. Awesome. I, I'm, I'm stoked to continue to connect and, um, we'll, we'll have to do a follow up to this in a couple of months. And, uh, I appreciate your time and I can't wait to uh, get this out to the world. Thank you so much, brother. Appreciate it, man.